When we think of astronauts, we think of healthy, smart people. We tend not to think about the ill effects on their health, nor how we would treat people who are injured or become ill in space. Meow! Hoople's Cat here. This video is going to look at the bad effects space travel has on human beings and on human medications. We're also going to use space to actually answer some questions we might have on expired medication use, which you should never do. But it turns out if you're going to go to Mars and come back again, you're probably going to have to take expired medications. And there's a few scenarios down here on the Earth that might require you take expired medications. Weightlessness causes muscle loss, eye issues and nausea, among a host of other issues. Muscle loss will happen down here if you're inactive in a bunker. Is it safe to be in space for human beings? Not really, as this slide shows. This is a huge number of medical events compared to the number who flew on these missions. Every organ in the human body had an issue. But can we use the International Space Station to learn more about medication shelf life down here on Earth? There are five United States of America medical kits on the International Space Station. Other countries have their own kits. The five kits used are called convenience, medical emergency, oral, topical and injectable, and vascular contingency. This is a great way to store stock medications for an emergency, compared to shoving everything in one box, or even two boxes. When I next reorganize my medication boxes, I'm going to steal the ISS's idea. If you stop and look, you'll see data for normal terrestrial, down on the earth, medication expiry dates. But can you use medications beyond their normal expiry dates? Well, NASA or China will have to when they go to Mars. This is because the ISS carries 111 medications and it's been studied and after 60 months or five years if you like, all of the medications carried, all 111, are no longer deemed to be safe for human use. Many of these fail within two years. But in space, how big a deal is this? How many medications are these astronauts on the ISS actually even taken? Well, on ISS flights of longer than 30 days, they're taking them for pain, insomnia, allergies and nasal congestion amongst other issues. But how long would it take to go to Mars? Well, it's complicated, but it's nearly two years there and back again at its fastest. I'm not going to launch into orbital mechanics here. You can see how long current missions have taken. We'd need to go faster for human missions. How many medications per week do you think the average astronaut on the ISS takes in missions of 30 days or more? The average is 20.6 individual doses of medication per week. This is almost three per day. The lowest is 12.2 doses, still more than one per day, but the highest was 29 doses per week, which is an awful lot of tablets to be eating every day. Astronauts are in the peak of human condition, and yet they're taking an awful lot of medications. This reflects how uncomfortable living without gravity in a sealed metal box is. Earth Independent Medical Operations, or IMO, is essential for the ISS and critical to fly to Mars. At the present time, you cannot send a CT scanner on a spacecraft. In an emergency, you treat in space or they die. From the ISS, emergency re-entry is possible, but that might be fatal for some conditions. The craft they arrive in should be ready for crash re-entry. They used to keep an extra sized craft ready for this. I'm not sure if they still do. So we have a lot of data of ISS medications, but what can it tell us about extending shelf life down here on Earth? Store them in cool, dry, dark places. It's always going to make your medications last longer than if you don't do those three things. Doses of the active ingredients must be 95 to 105 percent to be classified as unexpired beyond shelf life. Clearly this is basically saying almost no deterioration is acceptable. Expiry dates are the minimum timed to 95% efficiency if stored correctly for all of the tested doses. But most of the medication doses may well be 95% for much longer than the expiry day or the extended shelf day. Like storing food, keep all medications in their original packaging. Using blister packs might decrease shelf life compared to stock bottles. But you'd have to research this yourself. I don't have any active research on this other than people saying that ISS medications deteriorate quicker because they take them out of the original bottles. But to me, this makes sense. Most of my knowledge on extending medication shelf life came from the United States Air Force SLEP program. But the ISS studies are helpful as well. They state this. I'm in Canada and all my over-the-counter and prescription medications have expiry dates. I'm sure most United States ones do as well, but capitalism means they actually don't have to. Even worse, US medications data is secret and this American study had to use foreign databases. Health is not, nor should it ever be a business. Let us travel back in time now to Chris Hatfield on the ISS. The question is, if you get a cloth dripping wet without gravity and you wring it out, what's going to happen? 
what will happen to a wrung out cloth. We may have the coolest washcloths ever here on the space station. I'm going to show you. Here's one of our washcloths. And now let's, let's start wringing it out. It's really wet. Looking at all of the four countries' kits in 2023 on the ISS, they calculate it was a total of 111 medications. Obviously some kits had duplication. The five kits are colour-coded, again a great idea, and I'm stealing it for my next medication kit update. Only the emergency medical treatment kit is actually colour-coded red. All the others are in a blue box with a colour-coded label. Hey NASA, if you're watching this, could you send me all five kits and I'll do a review on it. It might improve your ratings. There are three medications that are in more than one of the five kits. For Lexadine 180mg tablets, this is over-the-counter antihistamine. You can get this, this would be good if you're staying in place in the house or in a bunker for a while. They also heavily use Modafil 200mg tablets. This is an anti-narcolepsy med. It promotes wakefulness. I would avoid it. I would not stock this and if I had it, I would not use it. Bactrin in 500 units per gram ointments. Again, this is over the counter and easily available. They're using this for minor skin scrapes, cuts and burns. Apparently they get a lot of them as well. Get this without additional medications if you plan to stay in a sealed room or underground for a long time in a disaster. I cannot recommend this. This is a prescription med anyway and I wouldn't use it in a disaster even if I had it. It's also extremely trendy, especially for college students. I generally dislike non-sterile ointments into open wounds, but Kitty generally likes them. Have a few tubes for a disaster. Spaceflight is now older than me, and the history of space medicine is older than me. Mercury astronauts carried two injections, Demerol, a narcotic, painkiller, and I'm wondering if they carried enough of it to kill themselves if they got stuck up there, there's always been rumours of that, and IV Tegan for nausea. An oral antiemetic anti-nausea over-the-counter pill you could use is Dimenhydrate, but all medications, even over-the-counter ones, have side effects and contraindications, so use a good nursing drug book. A second-hand one within five years of now is fine to use. Pro nursing tip here is to get it in suppository form for emergency use. Sometimes swallowing it just won't work. And sometimes, sadly, using a suppository is not going to stay in there long enough either. But you can have to do what you have to do. Skipping past Project Gemini? Never! When we started on the front end, EVA looks very easy. We had no problem flying formation. And that's essentially what Gemini did. Uh, we learned how to use little teeny tiny bursts of power instead of monstrous little tiny micro, uh, micro bursts, I guess we call them, uh, so that you could maneuver the vehicle. Project Gemini added some new medications. I'd not recommend for use any of these for any Earthbound emergency. For my fellow space nerds, we have now arrived at the Saturn V Project Apollo. As time went on, some meds were added and some removed. I'd use all of these with caution, especially second all, in an Earthbound emergency. Of note, literal rocket scientists recommend carrying compressed bandages, i.e. tensor bandages, as I do on all earthbound trips. Apollo started using separate kits for specific issues and carried IV atropine and IV lidocaine, which are heavy duty cardiac medications, at least they were at the time. Did they think heart block would happen? So how healthy were the flights for the Apollo astronauts? Again, they had many issues compared to the number of people and the time spent. However, most of these are mission related and actually have no bearing on people down on the earth. I also suspect a lot of the Apollo incidents were covered up by the astronauts themselves. They had the right stuff. You notice the Apollo astronauts really didn't have any issues back on the Earth either that were actually related to spaceflight. Let us end our pleasant sojourn into the history of American spaceflight and medicine and return to the current ISS and its medication issues. Sterile water is used to reconstitute many IV medications. Please note, do not use glass ampules in a zero gravity situation because little shards of glass will get in your eyes and get in your lungs. This would not be a good thing. I'd say 10 years in a sealed container or 5 years in a screw top container for sterile water and then I'd still use it. But you've got to remember, sterile water on the earth is quite easy to make. We're just going to turn our uh, stove on. We've got our water heater on. We've got our kettle on. Okay, we're just coming to a boil. So we're going to shut this off. This study mentions one by Du et al. They found being on the ISS caused efficiency to drop below 95% for 25 out of 36 study medications. They had a controlled group of medications on the ground and over the same time 17 of them dropped below 95%. We're going to return to Duetol, a study from 2011, a little bit later on. 
This is because they studied antibiotics in detail. The United States Air Force Shelf Life Extension Program was a great source of data on extending shelf life down here on Earth. But this has now sadly been well hidden behind a paywall and I'm not spending $40 American to access it again. Back in 2019, I did have access to it via the hospital and I did a long video based on SLEP and it is linked in the description and it is well worth a view despite my nascent video skills back then. No one has yet been recorded as harmed by expired medication use, but please be aware no one is actually looking for that. Aspirin smelling of vinegar, even slightly, is poisonous. Don't use it. But if you use albuterol for asthma, you might start to look for alternatives if you're storing medications beyond their shelf life for possible use in a disaster down here on Earth. It's worth remembering that 88% of the medications studied in the SLEP program were absolutely fine for use long after their expiry date, 10 years after in many cases. SLEP used multiple manufacturers, brand names and packages. Almost all the meds stored five years beyond expiry date were useful. Back to the ISS again for our last flight in this video. Blue et al is a useful starting point to look at extending shelf life both in space and down here on Earth if you want to go beyond just watching a video. Tables 1 and 2 helps you decide when to rotate your stored meds, assuming you can rotate them. All of this stuff assumes ideal storage conditions. Not too hot, not too cold, very dry, very dark and in original packaging and not handled. Doxycycline becomes dangerous when past its expiry date and I'd only use it one or two years past its actual printed expiry date. However, four years past expiry is now approved for anthrax treatment. But you've got to remember here, anthrax is likely fatal. This doesn't mean the doxycycline is a stable med. It just means they have no other treatment for anthrax, so I'll give it anyway. There are two main risks of using medications beyond their shelf life. The first one is that you might not be giving enough medication to the person. And the second one, they might be toxic medications now and you might hurt them. Having only 70% of the medication compared to 95% of medication is absolutely no issue in an earthbound emergency where you cannot get a resupply of the medication. This would also be true in space of long duration. 75% efficient would likely be fine for the use of most medications, but toxicity is a dangerous thing. Again, doxycycline and aspirin come to my mind. Using the kaplan Maya curve, all medications in space are deemed expired by five years. See my video explaining the Kaplan-Meier curve and its utility to earthbound people. The link is in the description. Du et al. 2011 kept identical meds on the earth and then studied efficiency in the ISS packs compared to the earth one. Fascinating, but Du et al. 2011 gives us terrestrial end of extension times for antibiotics. Of note, all medications expire faster on the ISS. Here we see amoxicillin is great 880 days after storage on earth. Clavinate expires incredibly fast within a few months. Oddly, since 2011, clavinate is actually now often used bound with another antibiotic and actually has much longer published expiry dates. Liquid forms last much longer than capsule or tablet forms. Yes, you will need to shake the bottle very well. Ciprofloxacin lasts well in all forms. Of these five antibiotics on Earth, only levofloxacin and trimethoprim lose recommended efficiency after 880 days. I'd use them if 70% efficient. So thanks for watching this video. Hope you got something out of it. I do recommend a nursing drug book that's good. Get one, use it. Absolutely essential if you're ever going to go anywhere near this topic of extending shelf life. You should also probably check out my 2019 video, which I must admit really kind of needs an update. But I have so many things to do right now. It's on the list. I don't know if it'll be this year or next. And remember, this video reminds us... That's one small step for man. One... Toodles and fly high people. This video has been brought to you by Wolfie in Space Productions 2024.